Down along the river bank, the people crouched in groups, shivering in the night. Above them, the trees bent and the branches swayed as the wind whipped around them, and every sound seemed to magnify itself. These were now surroundings of people accustomed to the swampy, flat lands of Holland and the north German coast. The Saxons sat patiently in the darkness. The fragrance of the dank vegetation and undergrowth of the woods seeming to offer a strange sense of security. No one spoke. Each sat silently locked into his own thoughts. They were all tired after a rough day at sea and numb with cold. Finally, Ichnar came wading down along the river again. Everyone's eyes had been accustomed to the darkness, but they could hear him long before his finger could be distinguished when he was within a few yards of Heerwolf and the leading group. Ichnar! Ichnar! Hortwolf called softly. Over here! Over here! This way! Ichnar made his way to the bank and some of the men helped him out of the river. Is their camp quiet? demanded Hortwolf. It has been quiet for the last hour. Ichnar was gasping for breath. The noise of the wind in these trees and the river itself is a blessing from the gods. If the clouds could cover the moon, we could get past them easily. Hortwolf grunted his assent, and he turned to Otto. Go down the line and tell the people. Sorry, go down the line and tell the people to put the boats into the river. Pass the word that everyone must be completely silent, no matter what happens. Another hour or so, then everyone will be able to rest in peace. Tell them not to be afraid. Otto rose and moved off quietly down the river bank, and everywhere there was a rustling as people moved, and dry scraping sounds as boats were dragged and the sound of distant splashes as people and boats re-entered the river. Hortwolf and Ichnar led the way, and slowly the column of boats began to move silently at the dark, swirling river, as the Saxons dragged their boats along against the current. After about a hundred yards, the river bent sharply to the left, and on the right bank was a large open plain, backed by a low ridge of hills. The left bank ran along the bottom of a low, long, slow, curving hill. Dotted across the open fields along the right bank of the river, the Saxons could see the still glowing campfires. None were particularly close to the river, but two small distant figures silhouetted against the flickering light of the fires showed that the British had posted sentries to stand watch and to keep the campfires alight. Horses could be seen standing in the gloom along the river, river bank, looking monstrous in the dark of the night. Half a dozen figures stood waiting quietly in the river, where Whitgar and a scout stood ready to rejoin the main party. Hortwolf and Ichnar reached them standing up to their thighs in the black water. Hortwolf spoke hoarsely and quickly. Go ahead again, quickly. Find a place where we can get out of this river and get up onto a hill or into a wood. We don't know which way these British will go in the morning, but if they follow the river, we must get away from it. Vitgar and the others turned and moved off upstream, stumbling slow through the shallow waters, desperately trying to combine speed with silence. And slowly, very, very slowly, the first of the long black boats began inching its way up the river, with the sweating and shivering men and women heaving to drag it against the current. They pushed and pulled, their hands numb with cold as they gripped the soaking leather hides and wooden struts of the boats, feeling their way forward over the mud and stones of the uneven riverbed, with feet that were frozen with cold. They now could all see the glow of the campfires across the open fields, and every one of the Saxons strains with a barely controlled frantic desperation to keep the boats moving. Women stumbled alongside carrying babies, and young children held hands together in groups and water which reached up to their father's thighs was up to their waists, even to their chests. Fortunately, the river widened and the current slowed and slackened. The long line of boats slowly inched their way around the curve of the river until they began to pass up beyond the fields to where the river curved again away out of sight. Hortwolf, the chief, allowed the leading boats to go on ahead and he stood in the river opposite the British camp, softly encouraging and urging his people on. Occasionally someone stumbled and fell, and had to be helped back to their feet. Some of the old people and the youngest children had to be placed into the boats. 
Then, when the whole fleet was strung out along the bends, a baby began to cry. The sound of the child seemed the most natural sound in the world. Yet now it was a deadly, terrible sound, and the struggling hundreds held their breath, gripped with a chilling, monstrous fear. The woman struggling along in the water tried desperately to soothe the wailing infant, muffling the baby's head against her breast, and covering it with her woollen cloak in the nightmare gloom of the river. She risked suffocating the child, knowing that in order to save all their lives, one of the men would have to drown the baby if she could not silence it. High up on the slopes, in the open fields away from the river, two of the British sentries leaned on their spears near one of the campfires. They peered towards the river, unable to see anything in the deep dark of the cloudy night. Another sentry at a fire some forty yards away threw some twigs onto the fire. You that, Lou? He called softly to the two. Aye, man, a fox has got a, or a rabbit or a water rat. Down the river the whole line of boats lay still as all the Saxons stood motionless against the slow current. The whole tribe held its breath. No one dared to move. If the British were roused now and caught them stranded in the river, they would all die. Long minutes dragged endlessly by and nothing happened. High up on the open ground, away from the river, a horse neighed and snorted, disturbing the other animals, and the shivering Saxons could see dim figures of British guards moving away from one of the campfires to quiet the animals. Hortwolf looked up to the skies and held his breath as a chill of horror swept over him. Faint silver lines around some of the woods, uh, clouds showed large, clear stars in spangled patches of clear night sky. The cloud banks were moving over and the moon was coming out. He had to get his people out of this trap now, or they would never leave the place alive. When the clouds passed over, the wind would drop, and any noise they made would carry up to the British camp. Quickly he passed and slapped the shoulders of the people at the nearest boat. They had to throw caution to the winds. This was now a race against time. Move! Move! Go quickly! Fast as you can! His voice was low and urgent. He pointed skywards and the men caught his meaning. He waded from boat to boat down the line, mm -hmm. urging them in hoarse, desperate whispers to make the last effort to overcome their fatigue and exhaustion. On the sloping fields above the river, the British chieftain, Ploidaug, the killer, stirred uneasily in his sleep and turned over on the cowhide that served as his ground sheet. Clutching his heavy red cloak around his shoulders, a young prince already famous for his minor, bat minor battles and ruthlessness, he dreamed of future glory. He dreamed of how the bards would sing of his victories and of the Saxons and Picts that he would slaughter. In the river, a silent pandemonium was taking place as the Saxons heaved their long, black, hide-bound boats around the long bend and away out of sight of the British camp. Already the moon was beginning to show fitfully through the thinning clouds above. In a nightmare struggle against the steady river current, like a man trapped on a giant treadmill, racing frantically to get nowhere, the Saxon boats inched their way upriver. Hortwulf had waited for the last boat and joined the men and women pushing and heaving to get away out of sight. There were still five boats of the long line still in clear view of the British camp, when suddenly the clouds cleared from the face of the moon turned the whole river into a great twisting sheet of silk bright silver. The surrounding hills and fields are bathed, bathed in the cold bluish light of the full moon. They must see us now. They have to see us, gasped Otto. It is almost as clear as daylight. Bush, Bush, if they don't see us within the next three minutes, we'll be safe. Keep moving, keep moving, we're going to make it. Everybody, keep pushing. Hortwolf urged them on. Nothing happened. There was no sudden shout from the British camp. No alarm was raised. Here in the middle of their own territories, miles from the seashore, the British warriors expected no trouble. The size of the armed force made them complacent, for it would take a very large force of poorly armed invaders to attack them. Away up river, around the bends and out of sight, the Saxons moved on. They were filled with a sense of elation, almost a victory. 
and they no longer noticed the cold or their fatigue. About a mile up river, Vitkar had chosen a landing place, and the boats had been heaved out of the river up to, to a clearing. Already he had organised the people into transporting their food supplies and household goods and bits and pieces away through the trees to a wooded hilltop where they could finally rest. They had waited to time their immigration after gathering their harvest for the last time in their old country. They had brought their root crops and grain with them to sustain them through the winter ahead, which they would have to survive. Finally, after what seemed to be an impossible task, the boats were dragged from the river and broken up. The hides would be needed for shelters, and only six boats were kept intact. The act of breaking up the boats was watched in complete silence by the assembled people. Now there could be no going back. They had to survive or perish. For the first time, the sheer magnitude of their dangerous enterprise dawned on the collective mind of the people. Before, they had been too busy, bound up in the excitement of packing and leaving their homeland, battling with the rough seas in the long, torturous journey, pulling ashore at dusk and finally dragging themselves up the river. This was the moment of truth. They were here, and now they had to stay. 150 miles up to the northwest, away from the southern coast of Lloigria, that's England, the kings of Britain, Wales, sat in conference in the hall of Gugan Maur. While the Saxons had been rowing ashore in the early evening, the kings had sat in a large circle around an open hearth. Other minor kings had arrived after Theodric the High King. Greetings had been exchanged and arms set aside. At the far end of the building, the servants and the cooks were at work preparing the evening meal. Behind the king stood many of their nearest kinsmen and most trusted companions. The kings sat on wooden seats, as did many of their followers. Others leaned against the thick oaken pillars supporting the roof of the hall, and yet others sat on the straw which covered the floor. King Theodoric stood up, and the clattering and ribald laughter died away and ceased. He looked around at the assembled chieftains and began to speak slowly and distinctly. Cymru, kinsmen, there is a time coming for which we must prepare. Our fathers took this land rightfully and in peace over a thousand years ago. Many times others have sought to take it from us. None have succeeded. Five hundred years ago, my ancestor, King Caradoc, son of King Bran the Blessed, fought the Romans. In planned battles, the Romans defeated us. But in surprise, warfare and sudden battles, we were victorious, and so they respected us, and we lived together with them, ruling our own land independently, while they set up their trading towns. We of the Cymru were never a conquered race, nor did we accept the Roman customs. There was a murmur of assent and a shuffling of movement around the circle. King Theodoric paused and then went on. The Romans' main objective was trade and the security of the boundaries of their empire. There were many advantages to being within their frontiers. Many Roman nobles and princes and several emperors had British wives and mothers. Through my father, King Tyfalt, Theodosius, I am descended from the kings of Britain, as you all are. And through my mother, Tytval, Theodora, I am descended through Arthur and his father, Victor, from Maxim Ledig, Magnus Maximus, Emperor of Rome and the West. My son here, the young King Morris, is the true heir to both these lines of kings. My cousin here, Gugan Maul, son of King Canvan, is descended of King Pebiai, who was the son of King Uthav, Octavius, my illustrious ancestor. And so in his children there is the descent of the other line of our kings. We have agreed that his daughter, the Princess Onbroust, will be the wife of my son, King Morris. There was general applause and acclamation at this announcement, which is not actually news to any of the assembled princes. King Theodoric finished in Guggenmaur, 
Varius the Great, stood up to speak. With this marriage, we will create the unity of all the great families of our nation. There will be an heir who will be the paramount king, and no one will be able to dispute his claim to be leader of the people of the Cymru. This meeting is not only to confirm the marriage. We need to plan for a war which is coming upon us, and we must be united. When the Romans came, they sent their armies, and then after fighting, they took them away. They set up their towns and cities, and they traded. When their empire of the West fell 100 years ago, the people of these towns fled back to Rome, and their marks upon our land vanished like a morning mist in the noonday sun. Now there is a very different enemy coming, an enemy who will want all our lands, our homes, our horses, our cattle, everything we own and love. The Ostrogoths rule Italy and Rome. The Swebs, the Alans and the Vandals have taken Iberia and North Africa. Our people hold lesser Britain in northern France. And all the rest of France is divided between the Franks and the Visigoths. And still the Germans multiply and pour out from the mudflats along the North Sea in search of land. All Europe is taken, and there's only one place that they can go to, and that is our island. Since the Romans settled German tribes along the eastern coast of Logria, these detestable people have been steadily moving in, infiltrating into the quiet places, moving up along the rivers. The arid drunkard Gwytherin Vortigon, in his madness, made an alliance with these filthy dogs, the Saxons, and threw the whole island into a great confusion of wars. Before the barbarians raided along our coastlines, they could be chased away and driven off. But now they come to stay. And when new people move into the land to take it up, to stay and live... This can only be done at the expense of those who already dwell in our island. Guggen Mauer began to play slowly around the fire, talking as he went, seeming to address each prince individually. There was silence in the hall, broken only by the crackling of the logs on the fire and the distant sounds of servants knocking pans and bustling about their duties. Victor the General Uther Pendragon is at Oxford. He sends words to us almost weekly of fresh landings of these foreigners along the southern coasts. Our kinsmen in the north tell us the same news. They are coming in tens by families and in hundreds by tribes, and the shoreline is too long and too difficult for Victor to stop them. When Gwetherin settled them in Kent seventy years ago, they could be contained. But when his son, the blessed Gwetherin Vortimor, Defeated them in battles, he could not annihilate them. The survivors hid in marshes, in woods, in forests, and in islands off the coast. For thirty years, Emrys, Ledig, Ambrosius, Orlanius fought for thirty years to drive them out to control Logria. And now Victor, his brother, fights the same battles. These people breed like rabbits, and their destruction is as difficult as to catch every fish in the river and to kill every fox in the woods. These people are senseless, cruel, and destructive. They know nothing of the Lord God and of Jesus Christ, and there's no help of dealing with them. Guggen Maur sat down and resumed his seat next to King Theodric. There was silence for a few moments, then Agricola Longhand rose to speak. They listened to the Prince of David, who was a man of few words, and a notable soldier on land and on sea. For many years, since the days of my grandfather, the Prince Trifone, the Irish have sought to settle in my lands. Before they came as raiders by sea, but then they brought their women and children to make villages and farms. And this was when we could defeat them. When they came by sea to rob and pillage the churches and burn isolated farms, they could run back to their ships before soldiers of the army could be assembled against them. We were as a mighty bull attacked and stung by a swarm of wasps. But now, when they tried to settle, it was they who had homes and women and children to protect, and they had to stand and fight. We slaughtered them in their thousands, just as the mighty Geneda, Kenneth, and his sons drove them from North Wales. Now it will be the same with these Saxon pigs. They are farmers of few herds and have no horses. 
They would never know the time of day or night when our ships would bring horsemen and warriors to destroy them. They would never know upon which days our armies of horsemen would ride out of the woods and valleys to kill them and burn them with all that they have. It is my advice that it is better to let all of them who wish to come to Britain to come, and then we can kill them all. We will teach them the meaning of the word fear. There was general applause at the fighting speech by the much-respected Agricola. One of the younger men behind Agricola stepped forward and threw extra logs upon the fire, causing it to splutter and crackle, and throw dancing shadows against the walls of the darkening hall. Then Theodoric, King of Orgamorgan and Gwent, rose to speak again. We are remember that story of the day, which shall live in infamy down through all the ages, which until the end of our race will be remembered, when Queen Guthelin defeated those Saxon swine and drove them like animals into the bogs and marches of the east and into the islands off the shore. They came crawling like whipped dogs for a peace treaty. In the year 457, our fathers met with them, over 300 of our leading men, all totally unarmed as was the agreement. Yet the Saxons came carrying hidden weapons and slaughtered our representatives as they sat at the feast of peace. Our holy men who record history and know many things of many nations could find no similar happening in all history. Not in all our history. Not in the history of the Romans and the mar many barbaric people that they fought. Nor in the histories of the Greeks or Persians or any other nation. Ten years ago, when we ourselves were raided by these people, I sent my daughter Marshall to Ireland to the court of King Coramach, where she married the Prince Anlach, and so we made alliance with the Irish. The Irish were civilised by Patrick, who went out from among us, and up in the far north even the Picts received the words of God from our Bishop Ninan. So if we can make alliances with the Irish, we have no fear of raids from them. It also means that the Picts cannot raid us either, for they rely on being able to go ashore in Ireland to rest and get food after their long journeys from the north, and to be able to run back there to hide from us. My policy is to make our links with Ireland strong, and then we will only have one enemy to deal with. Germans are moving into Loigria. King Theodoric sat down again and looked around the circle, watching the faces in the firelight, trying to gauge their response. Reen, the hot-tempered prince of the West, rose from his seat and stood with his hands on his hips. I agree with all that's been said. We can set watches all around our coast, and we can patrol over our ships all day and every day, but we'll not prevent them from landing. Let them come ashore, let them build houses and plant crops, and then we can destroy the whole devil's brood as we choose. There is, however, one difficulty. How shall we expect King Coramac to control all Ireland? He does not rule it all. As for the rest, I agree that our young men should be encouraged to fight together and kill the Saxons instead of fighting each other. What the Prince Run says is true, replied King Theodoric. King Coramac cannot control all the other Irish princes. But my daughter is married to his son, took with her to Ireland the only lady companions, many servants, and chosen warriors who I appointed as her bodyguard. From these we get what we need most of all, information of what the Irish are thinking and what they plan to do. They tell me this. First that the Irish now begin to ra fear raids from the Picts, and especially them from the Saxons. They were taught a great lesson when the abominable Guthurin, Vortigan turned his mercenaries loose on the great raid of Ireland over 50 years ago. Secondly, they have seen and felt the military strength of Caneda and his sons in North Wales and Agricola in the West. They fear that may one day we will sail to attack them. The third thing I know is that they are becoming Christian like ourselves, and this will make a common cause between us. The king paused and looked around and smiled. A great crooked smile, the white scar across his face gleaming in the firelight. I have good news for our bold young warriors who dream of battle and a winning glory. Five days ago, Prince Fingar of the south of Ireland sailed with his host to attack our kinsmen and brothers of Brittany and France. I knew this hostile expedition, 
and the soldiers of the Prince Buddick and Prince Owl will be waiting for Fingal on the beaches. He will have no element to surprise, and his poorly armed pirates will be driven off. There was a buzz of excitement among the assembled brothers, cousins and sons of the kings gathered around the council circle. One of the younger men stepped forward alongside King Ithon. I am more with, may I speak? King Theodoric glanced at Gurgenmaur, who nodded. Speak if you wish, said the king. Morwy, the tall, dark-haired young man, stepped forward into the circle of kings before the fire. I have spoken with many holy men and others who had visited Ireland. They have small boats and they are not as good as ours. I cannot understand how they would undertake such a long voyage around our great island and across the ocean to attack our kinsmen in Brittany in such craft. It also seems to me that we should be able to catch them at sea on their return journey, if they are driven off from Brittany. Their speech drew warm applause from the younger men, and the kings nodded their approval. You speak wisely, Morwood, and the question which you ask points to the solution of our problems. The Irishman Finger has made secret alliance with Gunnar of Cornwall. All this I know from my spies in Ireland and the priests who pass back and forth between the churches of our two countries. Fingar has made safe haven in Cornwall. With Gunnar in Cornwall, he can shelter there on his journey out, and he can retreat there when he's driven off from Brittany. I shall be on the beaches in Cornwall to meet him when he returns. Guggenmaur stood up the instant Theodric sat down. Destroy Fingar utterly in Cornwall, and destroy Gunnar the Two-Faced, so completely that none in Ireland will ever dare again to move against us, and traitors to our island will fear to act with foreigners. There was a clamour of excitement and shouts of approval. The prospect of an immediate campaign was bound to cause excitement of the highest order. The High King stood again and held his hands loft for silence. Two days from now I shall sail from Cardiff and Barry to deal with Gunnar and wait for Finbar. I can also tell you this. At this very moment, Quadwal and Longhand of North Wales is marching against the last of the Irish who dare to settle in North Wales. He has driven their chieftain, Boyer, into Anglesey and has sworn to destroy him. Let us agree to plant as much corn and barley as we can and breed as many horses as we can. Let us unite to destroy our enemies. We must hold Carnwell to maintain communication with our brothers in Brittany. And we must hold Anglesey and the Isle of Man to guarantee our links with our kinsmen of northern Britain. We will speak of these matters again. The meeting broke up and dissolved into smaller groups. Servants brought beer in huge jugs and tankards and horns are filled and passed around. In twos and threes they drifted outside to wash their hands and clean themselves before sitting down to the feast. The night whilst they sat at the long tables in the warmth of the hall... The bards sang of the deeds of their kings and princes gathered together, and of their ancestors. Beer flowed and the guitar was passed around, and the young men sang comic songs and love songs. The noble women of Gugan's household sat among the kings of the high table, and next to the young King Morris sat the fifteen-year-old Princess Onbroust, now to be the future queen of the British. There was no wedding ceremony, simply a public declaration of marriage contract. The young girl had regarded the match with Ombrost, sorry, the young king had regarded the match with Ombrost as a matter of necessity, a duty to perform. He found the girl was beautiful, with raven black hair and deep blue eyes, and a beautiful face and form. She had high cheekbones and fair white skin, and as he soon found, she was an intelligent and a lively person. Morris, Myrig, looked at the girl and marvelled that she could be of the same family as old Gurgan, bull-like son Caradoc Broniarm. Ah, it would not be difficult to love this young woman. And so, whilst Hortwulf and this Saxon immigrant people shivered in the woods and tried to settle for a few hours' sleep in their damp clothing, far to the south, the young King Morris and his bride, the Princess Ombrost, were put to bed amidst much laughter and singing in the warm, spacious hall of Gugan Maur, and the blessing of the assembled princes was called upon them, that a son might be born who would be the future king. End of chapter 1